Item number SCP-7470 Containment Class Neutralized Special Containment Procedures The search for Daniel Collins and other missing persons related to SCP-7470 is ongoing and considered high priority. Monitoring of LeBlanc University and its environs is to be continued until further notice. Standard Foundation Disinformation Protocol applies to inquiries from law enforcement and the public regarding the status of missing persons. The Philip E. Lewis Memorial Auditorium is the epicenter of SCP-7470 and has been closed to the public and placed under Foundation jurisdiction. Closure has been blamed on safety concerns resulting from structural defects. Lunar surveys are ongoing. High Command stationed on Lunar Area-32 has been asked to review the contents of this file. Contingency protocols for the emergence of unforeseen lunar phenomena are being drafted. All personnel should prepare for a potential Amida class disruption event. Speak with your hazardous materials containment liaison for more information. Description SCP-7470 was an unexplained anomalous event which led to the disappearance of Daniel Collins and over 50 other people on the night of March 6, 2023, at roughly 7 p.m. Collins, who had experience working for NASA and other aerospace organizations, had been a professor of astronomy at LeBlanc University for well over a decade prior to SCP-7470. An extensive background check revealed no abnormalities besides an antisocial childhood. Prior to SCP-7470, Collins had been conducting an extensive study of lunar activity funded by the university, with emphasis on annual variations in orbital patterns. The exact nature of his research was never fully disclosed to the faculty or student body. His findings were expected to be revealed during a lecture interrupted by SCP-7470. Readings taken from local monitoring stations after the conclusion of SCP-7470 discovered slight gravitational abnormalities concurrent with the anomaly. However, they were not as powerful as suggested by other available evidence. See Addendum A for more information. Following the conclusion of SCP-7470, the Moon's Far Hemisphere, colloquially known as the Dark Side of the Moon, now faces the Earth. Foundation-operated astronomical divisions have been placed on notice should future incidents arise. Addendum A Video Log The following is a recording of the event captured on a tripod-mounted camera by a member of the audience during Collins' lecture on his research findings. The lecture was held at the Philip E. Lewis Memorial Auditorium at LeBlanc University. 54 students, faculty, and members of the public were in attendance. The footage was recovered by Foundation cleanup crews following the conclusion of SCP-7470. Camera activates. The stage is empty and the lights are off. Ambient chatter from the audience can be heard. Collins enters from stage right. Audience applause as light illuminates the stage. He approaches the podium and raises a hand in acknowledgement. The applause subsides. He adjusts his microphone. First, I want to thank you all for coming. I know the weather has been less than ideal. I just want to let you all know how grateful I am to have an audience here. You're all fantastic. <clears throat> when I was eight, after a particularly nasty bout of night terrors, my mother took me out into the cold Mojave night, sat me down on the dusty rocks, and told me a story. She said that every night, once the sun settles over the horizon, the moon comes out to keep watch over the earth. She told me it kept all the monsters away. The moon would watch all night. It could see everything. The biggest trees, the smallest mice, 
She even told me it could see all the fishes of the sea, all the way to the bottom. It was so big, so powerful, none of the monsters dared to face it. It could even see me, of course, sitting cozy in my bed. All night long it would watch. Then the sun would come up, chase the moon out of the sky, bathe the earth in golden light, until the next night, on and on, forever. I don't know where she got that story from, but it did wonders to reassure my frightened mind. The moon, guardian of the night, must be pretty good at its job, since I never saw any monsters around. <laughs> On my twelfth birthday, Apollo 11 reached the moon. For the first time, I saw it. Not through the dirty lens of a telescope, but live on television. Collins begins to pace the stage. The camera pivots to follow him. After that, I became fascinated with space. I mean, really, truly. Obsessed, you should have seen my bedroom. I had one of those rocket ship beds, the ones where you could actually stand up in because they were so tall. I had an astronaut helmet and a flight suit and at least a half dozen telescopes. And let's not forget the moon in my room, the little bisected moon lamp you hang on your bedroom wall that talks you to sleep. Yes, it's real. Look it up. I got one for Christmas one year. You can click it through the lunar phases and it'll tell you about science and folklore. I loved it to death. But nothing could compare to the real thing. Collins boots up the stage's projector screen. It displays a high-resolution image of the moon. As I got older, I started studying the moon. I'd stare at pictures like this for hours. I'd pore over images from the Apollo missions. Once, I even held a piece of moon rock in my hand. Gloved, of course. As embarrassing as it sounds, I would sometimes regard it less as an object and more as a person. Someone rather than something. I think I held a conversation with it on more than one occasion. The cover of the 1974 issue of Popular Science magazine appears on the screen, displaying a group photograph of high school kids alongside NASA technicians. Collins stands out in the foreground, wearing a bright red Hawaiian shirt and oversized glasses. <laughs> that used to be in style, believe it or not. This was a few years before I got an internship at NASA. I was never on the table for the astronaut program, but I did work directly under those who were. I was jealous of them. I could only be a desk jockey for so long. I needed to get out and make a name for myself. So when I was offered a job here at the university, I was over the moon. No pun intended. <laughs> I took up a position as an assistant researcher, worked my way up to professor, and... Well, the rest is history. Enough about me. You're all here to learn what they won't teach you in Astronomy 101. You've no doubt studied this stuff all your academic career. If you're like me, You've seen every documentary, read every journal you could find about our only natural satellite. Many of you have probably studied the many theories about its creation. That it was flung from the Earth during an early impact event, or captured and brought into Earth's orbit from some other source. Some of you might believe it was always there, formed from the same accretion disk as the Earth. The next slide appears. An image of the moon cracked with red chasms. This is what the moon might have looked like in its early years. Fragile, 
impure. Rift valleys like the one on the screen would have made the moon nearly unrecognizable, like the world's biggest omelet. <laughs> Get it? Because it looks like an egg? Um, anyway. An image of the moon as it would have appeared four billion years ago appears on the screen. There would have been vast pools of magma, lunar seas, we can only guess what they would have looked like. I always imagined the moon would have appeared as Earth did in her infancy, full of fire and heat and life. A Hawaiian lava flow appears on the screen. Do you know what happens to solid rock when it superheats? Well, it's a bit like taffy. It stretches becoming something in between a semi-solid and a liquid. The moon would have been amorphous, malleable, and it would have done the same to anything that touched it, assuming it got hot enough. It's hard to believe that our moon could have been anything other than the dead rock it is now. But it was like this for millions of years. Let's talk a bit more recent history. Man has known of the moon as long as we've known of each other. It's been the centerpiece of countless fables, symbols, and religions. It has captured and mystified us longer than we can measure. A grainy, distorted image of the moon appears. This is the first image of the far side of the moon, as photographed by the Soviet probe Luna 3. The first to see this were the Russians in 59, who later mapped it in 60. By all accounts, they were the first humans in history to have seen the entirety of our moon. But they weren't. I saw it first, almost five years before the Soviets, in the twilight hours of the early night. That time when the space on the horizon where the sun used to be is still fiery yellow, before the blues and blacks of night swallow up the sky. It's then when the moon is most prominent, right as it peaks up above the tree line. On this particular night, it felt so close, like I could just reach up and touch it. No stars out tonight, just you. But you were wrong. You weren't the same you'd always been. Your face was blemished, scarred. I didn't recognize the craters. I thought I was dreaming, but it all felt so real. You were bigger too, and not just because of the atmospheric distortion. You were closer. I knew that you were here for a reason. You were here for me. You were trying to show me something, but I couldn't see it. You were still too far away. I had to get closer. I was on the verge of something more spectacular than any other scientific breakthrough in the last hundred years. The moon had called me, and I had to answer. Why it chose me, I... I don't know. It didn't matter. For the first time, my guardian, my protector, had revealed its true self to me. But it was a fleeting moment, and it was gone in an instant. I had to see it again. I couldn't let this die with me. I needed to document it, to record it for generations to come. I needed a spectacle. I needed an audience. Collins checks his watch. It's almost time. Very good, almost time. 
The projector displays an image of the moon surrounded by a number of equations mapping its orbit with the Earth. Tonight is a super moon. It is currently seven in the evening. Sunset will occur in a few moments. It won't be long now. Collins turns to look at something off screen. The camera maneuvers to the left to display the auditorium's floor to ceiling windows. A large, pale object dominates the horizon outside. The camera focuses, revealing an immense, vaguely spherical presence similar in appearance to the moon, but distorted in both size and shape. <laughs> All those times I called to you, you were listening. I should never have doubted you. I'm sorry. I think I'm ready now. Everyone, please don't be alarmed. I will go first to show you it is safe. All I ask is that you watch for posterity. Several audience members produce cellular phones and begin to record. The object on the horizon has grown in size. The camera moves to capture Collins, who is now standing outside, enveloped in pale light. He is visibly shaking and speaking upward, but his words are unintelligible. There is a presence directly above him. The building's power cuts out suddenly, and the room is bathed in pale light. Collins's body begins to levitate as it is pulled upward by an invisible force. His body elongates towards the presence above. His face contorts, and he opens his mouth to scream, but instead releases a red-tinged slurry of blood and internal organs. The substance demonstrates non-Newtonian properties, initially falling to the ground as solid before gradually softening and levitating alongside Collins's upper torso. Collins's body becomes gelatinous. Pustules of skin, bone, and hair drip off his body, hang in the air, then fall upwards. After nearly three minutes, Collins's upper body disappears beyond the view of the camera. His lower body continues the stretch without breaking for an additional 10 minutes until it too disappears from view. Chaos within the auditorium renders much of the remaining footage useless. But at several points, members of the audience could be seen attempting to barricade the auditorium door shut with their bodies and movable furniture. After several minutes, the camera is knocked from its tripod and trampled. The remaining few hours of film have been destroyed. All 54 people present for Daniel Collins' lecture, including Collins himself, have been declared missing. Daniel Collins is presumed dead. When janitorial staff accessed the building the morning after SCP-7470, they found it empty and in disrepair.